Content is king has been the battle cry of inbound marketers since 2010. And where content is clearly important, language is actually difficult. I was walking through a hotel lobby this February in Vegas after a very late night out with clients and saw a guy eating breakfast about three tables in a restaurant and he holds his cocktail up to me at nine in the morning and says, dude, hair of the dog. I had no idea what this meant. I had never heard this statement before, and I'm like, what is, is he drinking hair of the dog? What ultimately is hair of the dog? Well, Eric talked about context in between marketers and people. I'm going to talk today about context in between people and devices and devices and devices. See, the internet is growing at breakneck speed. In fact, the search engines are having problem with it. We are creating more content today in any 48-hour period than we created from the beginning of time until 2003. There are more devices connected to the internet today than people. There are actually over half a billion devices in the U.S. alone, six in every household. And where the Internet has done an amazing job connecting us to our devices and our devices to devices, it's done a terrible job letting our devices understand what we ultimately mean when we talk to them or they talk to each other. A little context could help here. The semantic web's goal is creating context for devices. See, the web of today is about documents and data. The semantic web is about things, and by things I mean I mean people and places and events and music and movies and organizations and concepts. And the semantics web goal isn't only to let the web and the devices know what those things are, but more importantly, how they relate to each other. Now, I know for a fact that everybody in this room knows that Anakin Skywalker is the father of Luke Skywalker, right? Duh. But... Our devices, although they can parrot that back to us, they have no idea that Anakin Skywalker is a character in a movie and that Luke Skywalker is a son and what the relationship is between a father and a son and what that ultimately means to us. Now, the semantic web is the same web we have today, only we use what's called semantic markup language to add code in, into our web pages that gives the search engines uh, context and gives devices context so that it can understand the different things that we use it for. Today, we can set a date and set a meeting. But with the semantic web, when we set a date because... Siri, for example, would know people and understand their conversations from their social networks and know their geography and understand where they are and what they do and what they like. It can literally create a uh, book a room for us, set the thermostat, order the food people like, and literally get us coffee if we're out of coffee. And not only that, but tell us who they're talking to, who their friends are, and what their likes and wishes are. The, in the semantic web, the web actually goes from being passively helpful, which it is today, to being actively helpful. The semantic web will also improve search results. So because our devices know us, for example, if we Google cricket and we're an entomologist, we're going to get the bug cricket. If we're Prince Henry, we're going to get the game cricket. And if we're a curious child, we might get Jiminy Cricket, who in that horrible voice of my childhood told me to never tell a lie. This is how context can actually help us. And the semantic web is not a concept of the future. The semantic web is now. In January, Facebook announced their social, their social graph search. What Facebook is doing here is collecting data from you from outside the Facebook network. So when you like or share a page outside of Facebook, it grabs that information, adds it to your personal profile and it helps Facebook to give you a better news feed and probably more 
pinpointed advertising. But ultimately, if you've ever liked a, face, uh, a page outside of Facebook, you're part of the semantic web. Google, Yahoo, and Bing actually collaborated on a thing called schema.org, which literally set the standard for this semantic markup language. And they wanted it adapted, so adopted so badly, they did it in the most brilliant way. Like building a university and wanting to make sure all the sidewalks are in the right place, they built the university, they put grass out. They waited two years for the students to actually make their paths and then poured the, and then actually poured the, the sidewalks so the students would have to use the sidewalks. They'd have no reason to. Google went out and found all the best practices for the coders that were doing markup today and ultimately used that code and adopted it as part of schema.org so the coders would have to use it in the same way. And then they instantly started rewarding it. You know, it used to be the ranking was the thing that we cared about so much as inbound marketers. Now, actually, it's real estate. With semantic markup, we have the ability to create larger profiles of our rankings. Things like, like uh, this knowledge graph on the side and reviews and recommendations and authorship. So literally, with only two or three items on the first page of Google, I can take 40% of the front page and have 40% of the click-through rate. Google realizes it will hit people where they live, will offer them money in order to do this. And this is happening today. Because Google can understand context, we think they're changing their algorithm. For those of you who know a little bit about SEO, Googleism, algor Google's algorithm has always been backlinks. The more people that link to your site, the better your site ranks, right? But that's so old-fashioned and easy to game. Now that they absolutely understand what the websites are about, they literally can see, uh, using a, a philosophy called lexical co-occurrence, they can actually see how many web pages and blogs contain semantically similar language or are talking about the same subject as your website. So how do we leverage this? We figure out what the most important content is, and what we've learned is it's sharing. But here's the thing. What we had to figure out is how do you get people to share your stuff. We thought, like you probably do, write interesting content and they'll share it. But what we learned is if you write interesting uh, 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 stuff, people will actually consume it. But they won't necessarily share it. What we learned is that people share things that help create their identity online. Here's a shot from, from Google's, uh, and, uh, from Google's, from Obama's inauguration. And if you look at all the cameras, these people didn't need more pictures of the inauguration. There's plenty of documentation of the inauguration. They take these pictures so they can share and say, look, I was here. I'm an Obama fan. I was in the 10th row. It shapes their online identity. This is how things get shared. What we have to start asking ourselves is the content as brands we're writing, does it help people create, shape, and communicate who they are? And why would somebody want this as part of their identity? What will it say about them if others saw their participation? That's how we get people to share. And ultimately, sharing is the new clicking. You know, clicks used to be our absolutely currency. currency. There's an inbound marketing term that says clicks is currency. But what we're learning is the type of stuff that is clicked ultimately is not the type of stuff that is shared. For example, porn is clicked. But for some reason, people don't want to share their favorite porn. <laughs> Shopping, clicked a little bit less, but shared a little bit more. Experience, you guys see this every day. This is what's shared. I climbed a mountain, I'm on vacation, Foursquare, I'm at a restaurant. This is the stuff that's shared and causes, I'm curing cancer, I'm saving puppies. This is the ultimate shared content. So what kind of content are you producing that's going to help us share? And ultimately, what now can we do as brands, knowing the social semantic web is coming, to cement our future on the internet? And I've got four things. One, realize that your online actions 
absolutely affect your online experience. I know someone in the back is going, I never should have clicked on that Furby ad now. <laughs> everything you click on will affect everything you get shown. Two, as brands, we need to help this process. Let's start insisting that our programmers are including the semantic markup language on all of our new web assets. It's not that difficult, and it gives us significant advantage starting today. This is already happening. Three, start thinking about brand marketing as engagement and sharing, not consumption. And the last thing that we have learned that's absolutely paramount to brands is that understand that your people are your biggest internet marketing asset. You have people that wake up every single day as part of your brand. There is nobody in the world who has a better reason to share your brand than the people who are part of it. What is your content? What is the content you're creating doing to help them, ask them, to help them create a brand identity that shares with your brand identity so they are ultimately compelled to share it? Thank you very much.